as a comic book reader, the series attracted me because it was using real elements from the mythos of comics. That was really the idea behind the redesign of the characters, was that they wanted to have a comic book feel. Taking things that were unique and special to comics and moving into the cartoons shows how much they were coming closer and closer together. This was a graduation for the Super Friends, so it made sense. You graduate away from the Super Friends name and into Galactic Guardians. They've been doing Super Friends for a while, and I think DC particularly felt that they'd like to bring it more in line with what was going on in the comic books. There's a more dynamic look to the characters, more detailed, stronger animation. Oh no, you don't, Darkseid! Something that you didn't see when you saw Super Friends. The engines are overloading! We can't take much more of this, Father! Is this what you want? The evolution really was driven by the way we were working with Kenner at the time. The name Superpowers was viewed by Kenner to be more age appropriate and the Saturday morning business at that point was becoming more and more closely linked to the toy world. All these elements came together to make a little bit of a tougher show and a, and a show that would sell toys. I can't believe it. I can hardly believe it myself, but it's true. The model sheets were no longer done by Alex Toth, they were done by an artist named Jose Garcia Lopez, who was helping DC define the look of all its characters across all media. Garcia Lopez was the definitive DC artist at that particular period of time. Characters like Garcia Lopez drew just had power on every page. The Alex Toth designs that they had earlier had the advantage of simplicity, you know, that they were real easy to draw and almost anybody could draw them, whereas the, the new designs, you know, had a lot more modeling, a lot more musculature and, and that's real hard to draw in motion. Can we get a closer look? Sure. They just had a more buff look to them. They just looked more muscular and, and sort of more powerful. Great Krypton! And I think that's very much a reflection of in that period of time in the 80s when our definition of what a strong man looked like was no longer informed by the 50s and 60s. It was informed by Schwarzenegger and Stallone and sort of more of a Rambo look to the characters. So that was the art that you always remembered DC to be. He was always the face of DC Comics. And the fact that they took that look and rolled it into the cartoon just brought that closer tie to comics than I ever saw before. Cyborg. I don't believe it. Defeated by a teenage Tin Man. Cyborg was a character created by Marvel Wolfman and George Perez for a, a book called The New Teen Titans. And there had been attempts, even that early, to try to get Titans off the ground as a cartoon series. And they always hit the stumbling blocks, but something about that one character, Cyborg, really caught the network's attention and the producer's attention and DC's attention, and they really wanted to focus on this guy. Anyone who can capture Lex Luthor single-handedly would be a welcome addition to the Superpowers team. Thanks, but uh, no thanks. Which is a good choice, a good character. He was unique among the ethnic characters that we had seen previously in Super Friends incarnations, like Apache Chief or Samurai, in that he wasn't just a knockoff of established DC characters. He was a character in his own right, and created as a character first, and the color of his skin was secondary. He isn't just an African-American character, but he has a lot. He has his own personality. He has his own depth. He has his own problems and own strengths and own powers that really, I think, was a nice addition. <laughs> Looks like he's got you. Cyborg was a good addition because you got to see the team through his eyes. Everything was kind of new to him. They were training him to become a group member. Give me five, partner. You got it. Ow! Two down and one to go. Cyborg is uh, one, one of the more tragic origins. He's a kid who got in this terrible accident and had to have his body repaired, and half of him is metal, and he's understandably upset by that. Because he's in the comic books, he has a, a much richer backstory than some of the characters that were created specifically for the TV show. It's time you finally join the team. You can see how much we need you. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I was meant to be a member all the time. Great! Come on, 
Let me show you around the Hall of Justice. The beauty of using the entire half hour for an episode is that it gives you a chance to create genuine cliffhangers within the story, and real problems and real character dynamics, and it becomes more about how the characters deal with the problem than just simply, oh no, there's a falling meteor, we gotta catch it, the end. See you next week. I certainly hope so. As you begin to have a two or three act story, you can take people through an emotional arc of some sort or another, a physical journey, or just have more plot twists along the way. I don't believe this. An hour ago, I'm heading for my apartment, and now I'm on my way to someplace called Alopolis. Apocalypse. Whatever. And uh, the story started going more towards space, too. We had Darkseid as one of our regular villains, and we had characters who were capable of moving in space, too. We got into the space themes because it was a chance to sort of go bigger with it, and the, particularly with the introduction of Darkseid. Welcome to Apocalypse. Switch the flying cards. <laughs> Suddenly you had this potential, at least, for doing stories that were much bigger and would challenge the powers of the, of the superheroes much more. Only one way out of this. The game is over, Earthlings. Once you go to the longer story, you have a better chance to take one or two characters and really explore them. When you're in a shorter segment, 11 minutes, everybody has a purpose. You know, everybody becomes a tool because that's all they can do in a short period of time. One of the stories is called The Fear, and that actually began as a pilot for Batman, a whole separate series. Give it up, Scarecrow. You're coming with... <gasps> this place. This place. Fear was really important because it addressed the core of who Batman is for the first time. Come on, you can tell me. I'll tell you. It's about time you knew the whole story. You can't do Batman without talking about what motivates him to be Batman. You know, so now for the first time, we can really start to get into that. Oh dear, it looks like rain. Come on, we'll take a shortcut through this alley. No, I, I don't want to. Well, there's nothing to be afraid of, Bruce. It's only the dark. That was a landmark episode because Batman had been around for close to 50 years at that point. And in any TV incarnation, in any movie incarnation, uh, in any sort of radio incarnation, Batman's origin had never really been touched on. We all know the origin. Young Bruce Wayne is out with his parents one night when they're accosted by a thug who kills them and leaves Bruce Wayne an orphan. That's sort of heady material for a 1980s cartoon show. You can't really use guns. You can't show violence. You have to imply all that stuff. This is a stick-up. Give me your purse, lady. Oh, no! You heard me. You cannot show people dying on Saturday morning. You especially can't show parents dying on Saturday morning. Look out! He's got to and yet, they did a masterful job of getting the story across without once having a gunshot on screen. Mommy! Daddy! No! 